just to help me make it through. I need to feel that kind of love that only comes from you. If you'll just squeeze my hand and let me feel you by my side, Lord, you said you'd never leave me, you'd always be child I heard the preacher say that you you were a sinner's friend I remember when you came to me with a heart so black with sin oh the night you turned my life around seems you made me over new the mercy that you showed me Lord keeps me coming back to you if you'll just squeeze my hand feel you by my side Lord you said you'd never leave me you'd always be my guide but the storms of life sometimes won't let the sun Lord, I need to feel that kind of love that only comes from you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. All right. Yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many ready for the word tonight? I could always just scoot over a little bit so I balance it out because we, we're minus a few heads on this side of the church, but uh, we'll just stay right here. That'll be all right. You you don't mind turning a little farther over? That's probably what you do anyhow. Uh, we're going to turn in our Bible to Second Kings chapter two, and we're going to look at verse number one. 
Uh, over the years in preaching, I have uh, preached from this particular portion of text on a handful of times probably, and it is a very powerful uh, portion of text, and it is a common uh, ground for most preachers to preach from. And I think I may have even preached from this area of text, maybe even in this last year. But nevertheless, this is something that has been stirring in my spirit uh, for a little while now. And I wasn't sure when God would allow me to preach from here, uh, but I knew that God had been dealing with me to preach from this particular passage on this particular title. As a matter of fact, it's 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. But uh, as a matter of fact, I had actually thought there was a possibility that I may end up preaching this while we were out in revival, uh, but I'm very funny. I, I always try to seek the Lord and make sure that it's the message of the hour because the truth is, you, as a preacher, there are literally thousands of messages that you could preach, but there's only one right message you can preach when it comes to God's perfect will. And so... Uh, I thought about it, but I just couldn't feel it when I was out in, in, I say revival, but it was services we preached while we were out of state. So here we are tonight, and I'm going to preach this to you with the Lord's help, and we'll see where, where it goes tonight. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 1, if you're watching online, God bless you. We've been having little problems with our internet and different connections. Facebook did an update here a while back, and we've been having issues with live stream, but we will eventually get it up there if it goes out on us tonight. The Bible said, and it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Somebody say, from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord Liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Somebody say they went to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were with, were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master? They were talking about Elijah from thy head today. He said. I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto Elisha, and notice he's doing this again, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Somebody say, He went to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho at, the, at that time came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Verse number 6. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they too went on. You know what that tells me? The Bible shows that they went to Jericho. So somebody say they went to Jericho. Now they've gone to Jericho, and the Bible shows that Elijah told him, just call, go ahead and stay right here. But Elisha said, no, I'm not going to stay right here. Fifty of the sons of the prophets went and stood afar off, and they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither. So they too went over on dry ground. Guess where that happened? It happened there at the Jordan because Elisha refused to stay there, so they went to Jordan. So the Bible says there in verse number 9, And it came to pass when they were gone over, Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken away from thee, it shall be unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on, this means they're still going on, 
and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder, both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. You see, I want you to look back at verse 9 one more time, and I want you to notice the question that Elijah has asked Elisha after Elisha has been so persistent that he will not leave his side. I want you to see what it says. And it came to pass when they were both gone over that that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Do you know what he was basically saying? And I'm just going to put this in everyday English. What do you want? What is it that you want from me? You have followed me now. The Bible would show us that he followed him from Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho, from Jericho to Jordan. All the while, every step of the way, he continues to say, I'm not going to leave you. Elijah would continue to say, just tarry here, stay here. And he would continue to say, no, I'm going. So they'd go to the next place. Now in verse number 9, we read where he says to him in so many words, what is it that you want from me? With the Lord's help, I'm going to preach this title tonight of something God has laid in my heart on I want what Elisha had. Interesting, and the reason I say that is because Elisha wanted what Elijah had. How many knows that? Elisha wanted what Elijah had. But I'm standing before you as a pastor and a preacher of the gospel in 2019, and I'm going to tell you, I want what Elisha had. I want you to raise your hands with me. Let's pray and ask God to have his way in this service tonight. Lamb of God, we're thankful for the great privilege and divine opportunity to stand before this beautiful crowd tonight and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be able to share the very thought and intent of a great God of heaven. And I pray that your perfect will will be done in this place tonight, and we will give you praise and honor and glory for everything that you do in this service, and everyone can say amen, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Begin to think about what God had placed in my heart for this particular service tonight, and I began to look and gloss over the Word of God, and several things came to me, and one of those was the fact that as we read the Bible, some of you already know this, but as we read the Word of God, There are so many beautiful stories, so many powerful accounts of things that took place in God's Word. What we began to do as we read these stories, as we get acquainted with the individuals in these stories, and what I began to notice as I grew in the Lord, and the more I read God's Word, the more I began to read it, I began to realize that these men and these women that God was using, and these stories that we read about, these great people, that really these people were not superheroes. It was not as if they were from another planet, from another time warp. These were common, everyday, ordinary people just like you and just like me that had such a tenacious desire to do something for God. They were empowered by God, but they were empowered because they had such a desire to do something for God. You see, Elisha himself, if we back up just a little bit pre this text, we would see there was a day that the Bible tells us that Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he with the 12th. We know that God had ordained Elijah to be the man that would go and anoint and appoint his successor who would be Elisha. So he was called to go and to anoint the next king, which was Jehu. And then he was also called to anoint and appoint Elijah. 
Elijah's successor who would be Elisha. So one day, Elijah comes walking along, and if you can just imagine, he's an ordinary man just like you and me, but he's been empowered by God, Elijah has. And as he walks along, he looks over into a field, and he sees this man by the name of Elisha, who that God has handpicked for a specific time and reason. Apparently, God knew there was something in Elisha that he could use. It led me to think to myself, I wonder tonight, is there something in you and is there something in me that God saw long before time was ever invented, if you will, long before you ever said I do to the Lord and said I'll be a soldier in God's army. I've got to wonder, did God see something in you that he knew that he could use for the gospel's sake? I think that he did the same thing with the apostle Paul when he was Saul before he ever became Paul. He seen something in him that he knew that one day he could use for the glory of God. Now I know that we are sometimes either one of two things. Some people are so full of themselves they think that they're all of that and a bag of potato chips. Then there are a lot of other people who think that I'm a nobody. How could God ever use little old me? Have you ever felt that way before? Most people feel that way. I remember when I first got saved I would have never thought God would ever use me to preach but as time began to unfold and my life of serving God began to unfold you see God had a different plan I I was just the type of person that you know even one of the friends mother Jamie and Chris that we used to hang out with we were at their house one day and I hadn't long been saved and his mama looked at me one day and she said you know you got the gift of gab she said "You, you could be a preacher I know you could I said no not me. You know, I wasn't really interested in preaching. That wasn't what I wanted to do. But all of a sudden, one day, we were in a church service. Most of you know my testimony. We were in a revival service and I remember Brother Brian McDonald had to fill in because Greg Atkins couldn't do the revival. He went on in a revival somewhere else. So that night, I got down in the altar and I began to pray and talk to God. Well, the Spirit of God began to deal with me about doing something for him. Have you ever had God do that and you felt like God wanted you to do something but you weren't sure exactly what it was? Well, I felt that draw and that conviction on me and all of a sudden as I began to pray and seek the Lord, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to preach my gospel. I want you to preach the word of God. You know, as I began to pray, I thought to myself, Lord, you ever been in a place where you think, God, I sure hope that's you because, you know, you really want to know that it's not just your mind thinking out loud and so God is that really you but no sooner than that thought went through my mind brother Brian McDonald was walking through praying for different people and he laid his hand on the back of my head and he said brother he said I don't know why I feel like telling you this he said but whatever it is that God just told you you just need to say yes and do what he said to do I thought my Lord in heaven what a confirmation can you say thank God for his call and election and the Bible said who he calls he equips so I got up from that praying place and I remember that I got up and I went to the pastor of the church and I told brother Davis I said I want prayer would you pray for me and so he said yes so I walked over and I stood before the remembrance table lifted my hands as the pastor got ready to go get the oil while he was going to get the bottle of anointing oil that was on the other side of the church because they'd been praying for different people. While he went to pray, there was a Bible that laid on, some people call this a Bible stand, but that Bible, that giant Bible, large Bible was laid open. And I remember as I looked down at the Bible, it said right there, preach the gospel. In other words, to all nations. Uh, There was a verse, man, it was like a neon sign in a liquor store, man, just blaring at me. Preach the gospel to all nations. Uh, And I thought, Lord, if you haven't given me any sign tonight, you just, he was ringing all bells at the same time. Come on, somebody, and say amen. But God, could you really use a common, everyday, ordinary fella just like me 
a boy that's been in juvenile detention center, a boy that has nearly killed a kid at about 15 years old, beat him with a fire extinguisher until he was nearly half dead. Could you use somebody like that, somebody like me, who had uh, had basically told his wife he didn't want anything to do with her and had cussed her out and and had cheated on her and been unfaithful and foolish things of that nature. Could you really take somebody like that and turn them into a preacher of the gospel? You know, it just it blew my mind. How can God take an ordinary person? We think about Paul and we think about Elijah and we think about Samson and different names come to mind of great names in the Bible. But some of you need to understand that these were ordinary people just like you and me. Like my granddaddy said when I was a young boy, he said, they're no different than you, son. That man puts his pants on. My granddaddy called it britches. Uh, He said, that man puts his britches on just like you, one leg at a time, son. Ain't no difference in you and him. Let me tell you tonight, I found it to be true that if a man hungers and thirsts after righteousness, the word of God said he will fill that need. He will fill you. Can you say man? But I see Elijah as he comes along and he takes his mantle and he wraps it, the Bible said, on Elisha. Well, I would have to be led to believe that he did not cast it and leave it there, but it was almost as if, Brother Eric, come here for just a minute. So Elijah comes along and he's got his mantle in his hand. And when he walks by or comes by as Elisha's out there plowing with a 12 yoke of oxen and he with a 12, just pretend like you're plowing. Here comes the man of God. He's walking along, and the Spirit says, that's the man. Come on now. Won't you listen to me? The Spirit of God said, that's the man. And Elijah, he took his mantle, and he wrapped him across with that that mantle. Well, he stopped plowing, and he realized this is a significant and a divine thing. I want you to know something. When God calls you, you're not going to be what we used to say in the old days, mama called and daddy sent. Not because your daddy's a preacher. Not because somebody looked at you half crooked and said, I think you're going to be a preacher one day. But when God does it, there's something significant that you know that God has done something inside of you. Can you say amen? Amen. But he wrapped him with that mantle. He let him know that God was calling him into the prophetic office. And for a year, for that period of time, he worked. And he was a servant, if you will, like, followed alongside like a shadow. How many's ever worked a job where they gave you somebody to help you to be able to train them for what they were, you were getting ready to leave? You ever done that before? Nobody's done that. Praise God. I can tell you that what Elijah did, Elijah was training his successor. Elisha followed him. He watched him as he done miracle after miracle. Do you know it is significant? I'm done, brother. Thank you. It is significant in the fact that when Elisha prayed in the end and said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Do you know that it's in historical record and through the word of God that the Bible shows us that Elijah Elijah did 16 miracles in the word of God recorded. And Elisha, how many miracles did he do? Because he got a double portion of his spirit, 32. Why? Because God granted him what it was that he wanted. You see, Elijah wanted, Elijah wanted to bless Elisha, but Elisha wanted what Elijah had. He said, I want what you got. And like I said earlier, you know, Elisha may have wanted what Elijah had, But you know what I want? I want what Elisha had. Why do you say that, Pastor Myers? Because there's something powerful about Elisha. You see, if we're ever going to obtain what it is that we're after, we're going to have to have at least three things uh, that Elisha had. The first thing Elisha had was a determination, which is a firm and a fixed intention and to achieve a desired end. He also had a persistence. That means a quality at that pushes someone to continue doing something or 
trying to do something through difficult opposition. That is persistence. But there's a third thing that Elisha had that is so profound, and that is a desire, which is a strong yearning to have something. I mean, what I'm telling you is I want what Elisha had. Elisha had desire. Elisha had so much determination, so much persistence, and so much desire. I thank God if I could just have what Elisha had. I won't have to worry whether I'll be a good pastor. I'll just be one because when God gets in the mix and you've got persistence and determination and desire, God's going to smile on that and God's going to use you. Say amen, somebody. But you see, Elisha had that kind of desire right from the very beginning. He had so much desire to do God's will that when Elijah wrapped that mantle on him, he said, Elijah, just give me a little while. I'll be right back. Elijah's basically like, well, I don't know. Whatever you want to do, son, that's fine. Up to you. But Elisha, he went back. Some of you know I preached a message. It's in a a set of CDs we made years ago, and I preached it, become a memorable message. Message, uh, but I preached a message entitled Kill the Cow, Burn the Plow, and Don't Look Back Now. And I'm going to tell you something about the man of God. That man of God, Elisha, had so much desire that he said, Let me go back and let me take that cow. Let me burn it. Uh, let me kill the oxen. Let me go back uh, and let me burn the plow. And then let me kiss my mom and daddy. And then I will follow you till the day I die. It's basically what he was saying. So you know what that tells me? That tells me that Elisha was willing to go back. He was willing to he was willing to burn and get rid of his ability to do his occupation. Elisha was a businessman. He owned that, that oxen. But he went back. He had to have uh, uh, owned it. Otherwise he wouldn't have had the right to burn it. But Sister Linda, he went back and he burned that plow. You know what that tells me? Elisha knew I don't need this. I'm planning on going all the way. I don't need this. He went back, burned the plow, and he killed the oxen, and he cooked something to eat, and he kissed his mom and daddy goodbye. You know that basically when he kissed his mom and daddy, it was the same as to say, I don't know when I'll see you again, but I'm going to do the work of the Lord. Do you know he put everything that was most important in front of all of that? You know some folk, they got to go through all different motions. And if it's, God, if you can do it this way, and if you can fit it around this, then I'll serve you. But the man of God, Elisha, I want what he had. Why? Because Elisha said, I want what God wants. It ain't about what I want. It ain't about what mom and daddy wants. It ain't about what my family wants. It's about what you want. Let me tell you about desire. Desire is definitely a beautiful thing to have. And I want you to know what when it comes to desire, desire is that one thing that God will not and cannot make you have. Desire and hunger comes from within. What God can do. You see, if God was to put desire in you, place desire in you, make you want to love him, make you want to do right, make you, it would be a robotic thing like an unto God making you love him. But love of God is a choice. That comes from within. God makes nobody love him. That is up to you. The one thing God will not do is make you serve him. He's a gentleman. Can you say amen? But God allows us to have that desire that comes from within us. Sometimes that's the very thing that separates people that will do great exploits for God and people that will never do anything for God because it comes from within. But let me tell you what God does do. I told you earlier that I would tie in what I was talking about with my grandmother and that spaghetti with an inch and a half of grease on the top of it and coming down the dirt road to grandma's house with hoe cake and collard greens and black eyed peas and white rice and stewed tomatoes cooking on the stove and fried chicken. I'm going to tell you, that aroma began to fill the house. You could pull up in the driveway and you could smell the aroma outside of the house. Do you know what God does to the preaching of the word of God? 
Have you ever been in a place where you felt low and you felt discouraged, but you came to the house of God and even though you weren't really hungry, even though you weren't really thirsty, the preaching of the word or the singing of the songs of Zion, it whet your appetite and it made you hungry for more of God. Have you ever sat in a service and you heard the preaching and you thought, God, I want to do better. I want to pray more. I want to fast. I want to witness. I want to do more for you. Why? Because God uses the aroma of that to, to bless you and to cultivate and to arouse a, a desire within you. Even though God may not make you love him, he'll create an atmosphere where that you'll want to love him. If there's any anything about you that you could love God, he's going to stir up an aroma and a fragrance that is going to make you want something of God. He cultivates it. He cultivates it through the word. You see, what our modern church error has tried to do is to give people a synthetic, a synthetic aroma. Synth, you know what synthetic is? Anybody know what fox leather is? We called it pleather, plastic leather. They used the term fox. Some of y'all didn't know this, and you're learning something already. If it says fox Gucci purse or fox coach purse, you know that it's not a fancy title for one of their new editions of coach purse. Oh, fox coach, that must be one of the limited edition. No, fox means imitation, fake. It ain't the real thing. But what we have seen in the day that we're living in today is a lot of synthetic aroma. In other words, people trying to create something to cause people to want something out of God. Let me tell you, I, I love entertainment. I love to be able to have my flesh tickled, if you will. That's how the flesh operates. But there's something about what moves my spirit. I I can tell you I've been in services before that the music wasn't the best. I've been in places where the preaching wasn't even the best. It wasn't the deepest preaching you ever heard. But the spirit was there. And you know what does? The spirit draws spirit. Amen. Flesh ministers to flesh. Somebody say amen. I don't want nothing synthetic. Give me the Holy Ghost. Give me the power of God. Give me the power of the Holy Ghost. Because that will cultivate an aroma that will make you want to get close closer to the presence and the fire of God. Can you say amen? Somebody say, I want what Elisha had. You see, I'm convinced that this is one of the things that's a major part of the reason that Elisha received the double portion that he got. I want you to think about the text for just a minute. When we read through this text, the Bible shows us that as he travels along and we see him going from one place to the other, the Bible would reveal to us that they start out in Gilgal. Then, if that's not enough, as I mentioned earlier, the man of God, Elijah, he tries and tests his, his desire. Do you know that there are times that God will allow stuff to happen to test your desire? There's a song that me and my daughter used to sing quite a bit together. I've had to learn to sing it a lot more by myself. But it says, how bad do you want it? I want everything God's got for me. What does the word say about it? Resist the devil and he'll flee. Hey, enough is enough. I'm coming to get my stuff. And, the, and that song says, how bad do you want it? Let me ask you the question tonight. Just how bad do we want more of God? Do we have an Elisha spirit? I'm asking you, do you have an Elisha desire? Because Elisha started out in Gilgal with Elijah. And when Elijah said, Terry, here, stay right here, that wasn't enough for Elisha. They went on to Bethel. When they got to Bethel, he said, no, stay right here. And Elisha said, no, that ain't enough for me. I know Know what I want. Uh, I'm ready to go all the way. Let me ask you, how many of you willing to leave Gilgal and head to Bethel with God? How many willing to leave Gilgal and say, I'm not going to leave your side, God? And he went to Bethel, and when they got to Bethel, you can see that there were sons of the prophets uh, that came by, and they got in his ear, and they said, son, do you understand that God's going to take Elijah from your head today? He's going to take Elijah away from you. Why don't you just stay right 
right here. But Elijah said, I know that God is going to take Elijah today. How he's going to do it, I don't know. But I'm not leaving his side. So they went on uh, from Bethel to Jericho. And when they got to Jericho, the sons of the prophet in Jericho, they said the same thing. Don't you understand that God's going to take your master from your head today? And he said, I don't want to hear it uh, because I've got something in mind. Uh, One of these days, I'm going to have a double portion. I'm staying focused on what I want from God. So they left Jericho. And they left Jericho and went on to Jordan. I have met a lot of people in serving the Lord and pastoring that have never made it out of Gilgal. You can't hardly get some folks to show up for church, let alone come out of Gilgal. I have preached in services and atmospheres where I promise you when I tell you this, there was so much conviction in that service that saved people, been saved all their life, wanted to go to the altar and ask God if they were still saved. Huh? Have you ever been in a service where there was conviction like that? Let me tell you what's missing in a lot of church today. Conviction. I'm not talking about condemnation and a guilty this and that. I'm talking about conviction. The root part of conviction means to convince. What that means is that means you're sitting on a church pew or a soon to be church chair and God's talking to your heart and God convinces you you need more of the Lord. And when you get convicted and God can convinces you you need more you say God I'm going to react because you have spoken to my heart do you know that a lot of folk will never leave Gilgal and never even make it to Bethel why because they don't have what Elisha had some of them would never even stop plowing with the yoke of oxen for some people it's inconvenience God if if it's going to work out with my schedule God if I don't got to sacrifice anything but let me tell you him and there are times of my life. Uh, You know, I look around. Can I just talk to you out of my heart? I looked around this church this morning uh, and there wasn't very many places for anybody else to sit. It was nearly a full house. I don't know. We may have had uh, close to a hundred. I don't know. I didn't count. But I can tell you this morning, uh, it ain't always been like that. I can remember times uh, that I had to walk off from things that I worked hard for. I pastored one little church in Micah, Florida, where I sold all my tools uh, just to be able to keep food on the table because we lived in the middle of nowhere and nobody could help us. Watch the clerk, one of the finest church clerks you could ever meet, come to me one week. And Brother Roy, she handed me a check, tears running down her face. And she knew that I had three kids to take care of. There was no way for me to work. The the closest Walmart was 35 miles. And I would tell people, I said, it costs you more in gas to get a haircut than a haircut. And I ain't never met nobody down there that could have could cut hair. I don't know. They need a school down there or something. Worst mess I ever seen. But anyway, she gave me that $50 check with tears running down her face. She said, Brother Myers, I'm sorry, but this is all the church can afford to give you this week. And here I am. I got to put food on the table. We lived in a little old uh, parsonage there and the floor was eat up with termites. One night I got up to go to the bathroom and fell slapped through the floor. I had to spend the next several weeks trying to rebuild a house that should have never even been there in the first place. But I did it because of desire. Somebody say desire. Desire kept me. Desire led me. Desire provided for me. And I said, God, I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, I've worked around the church like a slave at times. Uh, Times I've worked 12 to 16 to 24 hours uh, staying at the church working. If I'd have been working in the world, I'd have been making money hand over fist. But the Bible said, lay not up for yourself treasure on earth uh, where rust, rust and moth does corrupt. But he said, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. I would take my tools, sell them. I, I, I used to have, I, at that time, I had thousands of dollars worth of tools from the business I had before I went to Mayaca, Florida. When I left, well, let me say this. I found out later, and this, is, this has been true everywhere I've ever been, and many pastors I've known, some of the people 
to put the most money in the church offering is almost every church is the church clerk. Why is that, Brother Myers? Because the church clerk knows that if somebody don't do something, that that electric bill won't get paid. And they see the final number on the, on the receipt or the slip. They see what has to be done. And I found out later that who was it that gave me the $50? It was the clerk. I looked at the record later because I was trying to find out about some of the church finances, how we could better be a budget-friendly church and to be better stewards. And I looked and saw right there who it was that gave the $50 and it was none other than the clerk had it not been they were going they were hardly making it their self they were having to get them a food from a food bank type situation like a like a type organization there here they are they're struggling to get by but she was willing to give fifty dollars uh, to this preacher and here I am thinking it ain't much but let me tell you that's that clerk and her husband are still at that church where we were at in Micah Florida and they're still serving God still a beautiful family still loving God what kept her what caused her to do what she did desire she had what Elisha had let me tell you what makes the greatest saints people that got what Elisha had you know what people get when they get what Elijah had it's because they had what Elisha had I've told this story before maybe you've heard it but I stood out in the parking lot Man, I was blown away whenever that floor caved in at that parsonage. I didn't know what we were going to do. The church we pastored, if you've been in our fellowship hall, the sanctuary was about the size of the fellowship hall. And I don't remember, there could have been five pews, six, I don't know, on both sides, and they were close together. Two rows of pews, just a little sanctuary. If you got 35 or 40 people in there, you were pretty you were pretty tight quarters. We'd remodeled it, done all that. But I had worked over there at that at that parsonage, but let me say that before I got to the point where we worked on it, I called up my district overseer at the time at the Church of God. And I said, "Brother Griffith, I said, um, we, our floors eat up with termites." I said, "I crawled up underneath the house." And there was tunnels as big around as your thumb in the middle. And the, the parsonage was probably about 30 to 36 inches off the ground. And there was tunnels that were from the ground all the way to the floor everywhere. There were two by sixes underneath the floor that were eat clean in two. And there would be a spot that far missing, nothing there. No two by four whatsoever, no two by six at all. And I told him I, well, the condition. He said, well, Brother Myers, can you, is there anything can be done? I said, well, you might want to come look at it. So my district overseer come to the church. I'm just saying this for word, for sake of testimony. But he came to that church, and he looked at the parsonage floor. He crawled and looked in there. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, brother. He said, you're a better man than me. He said, because I wouldn't have my family in this mess. This is a, this is a hot mess right here. I would not let my kids or my wife live in a house. He slap up with termites like this. This is ridiculous. And he said, I don't know what the church of God's going to do. And so he contacted the state office. And the state office realized that it's a little church in the middle of nowhere and if they can't get a pastor to come out there somebody they understand that the odds if they can't have a house for us to stay in they may not be able to have a pastor there so the first thing that came up well maybe we'll just maybe we'll just close that church down and sell the building maybe we'll just sell it I went to that church. I don't know why I felt like telling this. Maybe somebody online or somebody here needs to t- hear this. But I went to that church and I had a meeting. And I began to tell these people. And there was a handful of people that had been in this church for many years. Some of them was my clerk and her family. And I told them, I told them the worst case scenario. I watched them as they sat their brother Eric and cried. These are some of the same people that sold spaghetti dinners and barbecue dinners and they, they worked hard and labored hard for years to get the building paid for and to keep it taken care of and to keep the doors open for years. And as I stood there that night, my heart melted in me, and I thought, Lord, you've given me a builder's hands. You've given me a builder's mind, and you've given me a builder's heart. Now looking back, I understand 
that the best part about it was God had given me the desire like Elisha. And so I told those people when we got to the end, I I had already planned on telling them there's nothing else that we can do. This is the end of the road. But when we got done with that meeting that night that I had with that church, I don't even know what came over me other than to say it was the Holy Ghost. Brother Roy, I looked at those folks sitting in the pews, and I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, if you'll get behind me, I'm going to step out by faith. I got no idea how I'm going to do this. We had a little bit of money in the bank. It wasn't much. I don't know how we're going to afford to do it. I said, but if you'll get behind me, I will fix that parsonage floor. If you'd have seen it, you'd have realized what a challenge that was. I said, how many of you will get behind me? How many of you will stand behind me in prayer? How many of you will help me to make this happen? I saw several hands that went up. I called my district overseer. I said, slow the cart down. I said, I'm going to fix it. Brother, there's, are you sure? There's no way you're going to be able to fix that. That is a, that is a flat mess. How are you going to do that? I said, God, I felt like gave me an idea. I said, I'm going to rip the floor out right up underneath the walls and leave the walls hanging. I said, they may fall. I don't know. And I said, I'll build it right back up. In the kitchen of that parsonage, it was double-layered ceramic tile, one of the dumbest things you could ever put on particle board in a mobile home that's 35 or 37 years old. But I dug it out, and I'm going to tell you something. As much as I'd like to stand here and tell you, there was a lot of other Elisha-spirited people that would show up that said they raised their hand and said they'd be there. I had one man that gave me a hard time most of the time. His wife tried to beg him to come to church. And he showed up. He was one of the people that showed up to help me. He said, Preacher, where's all your help at? And he was always one of them controversial. He said, Just like I tell my wife all the time. He said, the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. He said, but I can't sit at the house, preacher, knowing you're up here doing this, trying to help this church keep the doors open and not help you. Well, over a period of time, my clerk's husband, he came up and helped, and uh, maybe one or two other people, hardly nobody showed up. I got pictures of that mess that we fixed. And let me tell you, for the glory of God, over three quarters of the floor, from one side of a double wide mobile home all the way to the other side. We ripped the floors out. Walls didn't fall. We built it back with three quarter inch plywood and God helped us to get it done and to this day that church is still open. To this day they're running anywhere from 45 to 65 people in church. Hey man, they got a pastor that followed after us that is a man like myself with an Elisha desire. Him and his wife are two of the greatest people. Reminds you a lot of me and Sister Myers as far as you look look at him. We look a lot alike and so much. Sister Myers does anyway. And so let me tell you this. The reason I'm sharing that with the church is that I stood out there in that parking lot and there was a, a brother that rolled up in the termite business and he was going to spray the floor after we got the parsonage floor fixed. And he rolled up in there and to make a long story short, he said to me, he said, brother, he said, there's something about you. I was raised in church. He said, I've been backslid for years. He He said, but when I hear you talk, he said, there's an anointing on you that I can't explain. Uh, He said, but man, when I get to talking to you, he said, I've got one question for you. I said, what's that? He was back to the little church that we were pastoring. It's a little building. And he turned, looked over his shoulder, And he pointed at that little church I was pastoring. He said, I just got one question for you. He said, what are you doing here? He said, you have an anointing and there's a power over you. He said, I I haven't felt around another minister. And I'm not saying this to put any roses on this. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just telling you what happened for the sake of example so we understand how God works. 
He looked over his shoulder and asked me that question. I felt the Holy Ghost come over me, and I looked at him, and I said, well, if you've been in church, then you know the Bible, my friend. I said, the Bible said if a man will be faithful in a few things, he said God will make him ruler over many things. I said, when you turn around and you head out of this parking lot in that pickup truck and you see that little building over there, I said, that's my few things. Uh, You know, tonight or this morning when I looked around this church and saw what God did, that is simply because, just like Elisha, a man that says, I won't stay in Gilgal, I ain't staying in Bethel, I ain't staying in Jericho, I'm going to Jordan. God said, the most persistent, the most determined, those that are willing to have a desire like Elisha will have a double portion of God's spirit. We say we want more of God. We say we need more of God. But you know there's an old saying that's been around for many, many years. And if I say it, you're going to recognize it. Actions speak louder than words. You can tell somebody you love God. But your actions will prove it. Elisha can tell Elijah, I want something from you. But his actions will prove it. His actions took him from Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho, and from Jericho to Jordan. I wonder just how far you're willing to go. I wonder how far the church of today is willing to go. Let me warn you of something. When a man has that kind of desire, when you finally tap into that, there is one warning that I need to make sure you understand. If you are not careful, when you get that kind of desire, it can easily make you become judgmental of the people that have no desire. But I'm going to caution you because such were some of you. There was a time you didn't serve God either. There was a time you didn't have the desire either. So the best thing to do is pray for the ones that don't have a desire and remain humble through it. Because while you see yourself, well I I can't see myself doing anything else but being faithful. Don't become haughty and prideful and all of that come on now you've got to be humble through it all and say God help me to pray for others to have what Elisha had it was what Elisha had that got down inside of me when I first got saved that led me to get down in the altar man I didn't even know what in the world Pentecostal was I halfway knew any of this stuff man I I got down in the altar and I started praying. I just heard about the Holy Ghost. I didn't understand the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I really didn't. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, I went to church with my, where my grandma went to church, and there was something about the church that drew me there because there was power there, but I didn't quite understand them speaking in tongues. And I sat in a church service one morning, and... There were church services. Y'all know what we call a Holy Ghost blowout? And where we don't have no preaching? You ever been in a service? If you ain't ever been in a service like that, you need to be. But I, being a ragamuffin, I mean, I was just a hard head and looking for a reason to be aggravated about something and not go to church because there's a lot of those folk too. I was one of them. I sat there stoved up, Brother Coon. I sat there whenever the Holy Ghost got to moving. And my pastor's wife gave out a message. I sat there and thought to myself, now look at this. I went home after church. I'm just telling you all the truth. I don't believe in being transparent. I went home that day and I told my wife, I said, I didn't get a thing out of that service. What do you mean? I said, people are running around speaking in India and I got no idea what they are saying. Come on now. I said, I ain't getting nothing out of it. Well, all that was was me. I didn't want to get nothing out of it. I didn't want to get close to the fire. But I'll tell you what I did. I messed around and did get close to the fire. And before you know it, I was probably sounding like I was talking in Indian. Come on now. Before you know it, I got close to that fire and the power of the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. And I began to realize these folk ain't crazy. They're crazy for the Lord. These folk ain't out of their mind. They're out of their mind for the Lord. They got a desire for the things of God. You see, I'm just being honest and open with you. And that's my story. I don't know what your story is, but I can tell you this much. If you're ever going to obtain any 
anything in the Lord. You got to have a desire like Elisha had. That desire, Brother Roy, it propelled me, it pushed me. I got down on the altar, like I said, and I didn't even know much about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, just been just kind of remotely around a little bit of it. And I got in that altar and I started praying. I wasn't even really praying, God baptized me with the Holy Ghost. I was just praying, God, give me more, you know. God, give me whatever you want to give me. I wasn't saying God baptized me in the Holy Ghost that I can remember. Boy, I'm telling you, one night I was laying in there in the altar and I got to praying. And some of them old saints of God. Anybody ever been in a church where you get a group of them saints of God, them women, you got one in one ear car going, oh, God, send the fire. You got sister so-and-so here. Oh, God, send the rain. And you got somebody else. God, send the flood. Let me tell you something. I thought it was going to be a catastrophic weather tornado when it's all over with because these are sisters are going to pray you through or you're going to get worn out one of the two. And so they are praying. I believe in that kind of prayer. We need more prayer warriors. Don't you agree with that? When you see somebody get in the altar, man, we ought to flood the altar. That'll be every Everybody, 100%. That's the way I believe it. But I got in that altar, and I, I can't even remember that one. Sister Hudson, that just came to my mind. Sister Hudson, she was an old saint. Boy, she was dedicated, loved God. Her husband was a preacher and a pastor for many years. And here she is, a widow woman. And boy, was she faithful and a powerhouse for God. She was constantly being used in the gifts of the Spirit in that church. And while I prayed down, and they got me up on my feet. They didn't want me down on my knees. They said, come on, get up, son. Get up on you. I got up on my feet. Lift your hands, brother. Lift your hands. I lifted my hands. They laid hands on me. They got to praying for me. And let me tell you something. I've drank alcohol. I've smoked dope. I've had different experiences of things in my life. But there ain't nothing that compares to what I felt that night. The power of the Holy Ghost came down and kissed my soul. I said the power of the Holy Ghost came down and kissed my soul. And when it did, man, I fell in that, that, that altar and fell down in the floor like a sack of potatoes. Boom. We're not talking about somebody or some fake stuff of blowing you down neither with their stanky breath. I laid down there in that altar and I rolled around. Woo, boy, I felt God. Man, I felt so light. I felt like I was just floating in the air. I felt something I never felt. While I'm laying down there in the floor, I'd been down there a long time. Well, after a while, I thought, started kind of coming to. I thought, well, I probably better get up. And uh, Brother Claypool, I remember I stuck my hand on the edge of the, the floor, and I stuck my other hand up on the edge of the pew behind me. And I went to lift myself up, and I fell almost flat on my face. And all them saints are standing around. They got to chuckling. They said, that's all right, Brother Joe. Just stay right there for a little while. You drunk in the Holy Ghost. I didn't even know what that was. I was intoxicated, just like there was on the days of Pentecost. Whenever it said, these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing that it is the third hour of the day. But what was it? It was the Holy Ghost on them. People thought they were crazy. That's all right. Think I'm crazy all you want. I know what the Lord did in me. Boy, I got up that night. I got up all of that night. Man, I thought, whoo, I got the Holy Ghost tonight. And uh, some of you heard me tell this story. I, I got ready to walk out that night, and that same Sister Hudson that was powerhouse down there praying with me, she was in the foyer, and I come walking through there, and she reached out her hand. If you're a sister, Rachel, she retched out her hand. She retched out her hand, and she grabbed a hold of my hand. You know them older saints, they like to do this. Sometimes if it's somebody weird, it can be creepy. But she was really sweet. But they like to hold your hand and not let go. You know what I'm saying? Praise God. You never know what I'm going to say. But she reached out got a hold of my hand. She held on to my hand. She just shook my hand. And she said, Brother Joe, I'm looking. Brother Joe, you almost got it tonight. Well, I was smiling. I thought to myself, what? And then I walked out of church, and that night, I'm getting in the car. I'm still thinking. That's all I can hear, Mama. You almost got it tonight. I got home. I asked my wife. I said, what does she mean I almost got something tonight? What? I don't understand, you know. But something happened. Something changed. You heard being saved, being sanctified, 
and being baptized in the Holy Ghost. That night, God sanctified me in that altar. Separated. That's what the word sanctify means. Separated me. You see, God can forgive you in salvation, but sanctification will take your want to and change it to something totally different. You see, I was real bad. I was in construction, and I don't know why I'm testifying like this. Maybe you need to hear this, but I was in construction, so it was a normal thing for people to just make up stuff to cuss about. You go to a portal it and you got to be blinded because you see things you shouldn't see. No human should have to see. So I was surrounded by that for years. It was part of my verbal DNA, everything. Man, I was scared, slapped to death to get around the preacher and it was gonna, so I was going to say something, a dirty word or something. You know, anybody ever been there? I was scared to death I was going to let a word slip, right? Y'all still believe it's sanctified not to cuss, right? I am in the right church, right? But that night when I laid in that altar, I could not quit cussing for the life of me. My, you've heard me tell it. Some of y'all are probably tired of hearing it, but this is my testimony anyway. But my wife, she would talk about, oh, you cussed so many times. I'd say, no, I don't. I didn't. Yes, you did. I heard you said five cuss words while you were underneath that car working. No, I did. Yes, you did. I could not cuss. I, I get it down to just a few here and there, you know what I mean? But I could not. I could not crucify that. I could not get sanctified over that. But I'm going to tell you something happened that night. I may not have got baptized in the Holy Ghost that night, but I got sanctified. And before you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God is going to do a sanctifying work in you, and then he'll fill that vessel full. Because the Bible said that if you cannot put new wine in old vessels lest they burst. That vessel's got to be clean and cleansed, that you can fill it with that new wine inside of that vessel. You know, that's what God did in me that night. And you know what? It wasn't long after that. I got in that all altar. I, I still didn't really know much but I got in that altar and I began to pray and before I knew it the power of the Holy Ghost came down and kissed me again and before I knew it I was laying in the floor talking in tongues uh, as the Holy Ghost gave me the utterance uh, and let me tell you something the reason I got filled with the Holy Ghost is because I was hungry and I had a desire for more than just occupying a pew can I, can I get ready to near close here? I hope I haven't preached you to death. I'm about to preach myself to death. But anyway, this old getting old and doing this two times in one day gets rough. But I got in that altar and I began to seek God because of a desire. But even to this day, I have learned that through the process of serving God, I want you to listen to me now. Through the process of serving God, the monotony of doing the same thing all the time can cause you to become what the Bible calls weary and well-doing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You can get burned out. Has anybody ever felt a little burned out, a little discouraged? You didn't stop loving God, but you went through a dry spell or dry season where that you just felt discouraged, downhearted, and maybe even a touch of lukewarmness. I don't know. But you see, I have found that I have to often get down in the altar and I have to stir up the gift of God that is in me. Do you know? remember what Paul told Timothy? He said, Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Stir up that gift that's in you. Stir up that power that's in you. You can't let it stagnate. You can't let it become cold. you got to get in that altar. I see saints of God that got baptized in the Holy Ghost 25 years ago and it's still been 15 years since they've even been had a move of the Holy Ghost in their life. They're riding on an experience from way back when. Let me tell you, it's time for a lot of folks to update their testimony. When's the last time that the Holy Ghost moved on you? When's the last time that heaven came down and kissed your forehead and the power of God moved in you? I've met folks before, the only time they get excited is when they get a microphone in their hand. Only time the power of God seemed to get on them is if they get on the stage. Let me tell you, when you got the power of the Holy Ghost in your in your life, you ain't got to wait. 
Pastor, is that Bible? Absolutely. Because when you follow the disciples through the New Testament, they didn't have to be in a tabernacle. As a matter of fact, I would have to guesstimate that at least 85% of what the early church did happened on the outside of the church. And today it's a flip-flop or worse. Let me tell you, God didn't give us what he's given us for us to bottle it up to ourselves. But we've got to stir it up so that others around us can feel it. Now I'm going to close with this thought, Lord will. The one thing that drew me to the church, it wasn't their pretty pews, it wasn't their good-looking carpet or their fancy music. I'll be honest with you. I enjoyed the music like a lot of people, and the better the music sounds, the more interesting it can be. But honestly, the thing that drew me to the church, it wasn't their rules. I'm going to be honest with you. There were some things that if somebody would have came at me when I first got saved, said, brother, you're going to stop doing this, and you're going to start doing that. You can't go here, and you can't this, and you can blah, blah. I'd have probably been like, whoa, I, I don't know if this is for me. But you see, and folks left me alone and let me grow in the grace of God and let me find the will of God and the truth in the Word of God through the preaching and through the reading and through the Spirit. And you know what happened? God cultivated a life of sanctification in me and created a greater desire in me. And I can tell you tonight, the same thing God is capable of doing right here in 2019. Somebody say God can do it today. How many of you, honestly, when I ask you this question, have seen what I'm talking about where people seem like they just don't have what Elisha had? Where does it start, Pastor? Right here in the heart. When you really get it in here, nobody will have to beg you to read your Bible. Nobody, when you get it good and you get it, nobody will have to beg you to pray. Nobody will have to beg you to love God. Nobody will have to beg you to be faithful to the things of God when you get it in here. The difference is, is that some people are just serving a form of religion. They're not serving God. They're serving the idea of religious motives and motions and methods. But when you get it like Elisha had, God will take you from a Gilgal. He'll take you from Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, and Jericho to Jordan. I'd love to be able to see people right here in the church at Gray Street raise up new leaders. One thing I've learned, Brother Coon, as I began to get older, I'm not going to be able to go as hard as I've gone all, all these years for the rest of my life. God's going to have to raise up new men and new women. I've had in the years that I've been here, I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I've had, over the time I've been here, I've had people they would come to me and say, Pastor, if you ever need anything around the church, let me know. And then when I let them know, they would never. So I just quit asking them. Then they get mad because I don't ask them. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, we'd like to start mowing the grass from here on. I'm like, praise God. My family, we've been doing it all these years. Well, praise the Lord. I had to do it for a little while. Next thing you know, you look around the grass and be ankle to knee high. And ain't nobody mowing the grass. Never say why. Never don't understand why. And as much as I love people, and I don't mean no harm by what I'm saying, what I'm saying is desire will often change whether people will be faithful to what they do or whether they do it for whatever reason. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. How about you? Will you stand to your feet all across the house? I had lost my train of thought. I was going to tell you something earlier, but maybe the Lord just told me it's time to hush. I want to give you this opportunity. Miranda's going to come around and play on the piano some little thing. And sing and play and sing and play, play and sing. And uh, I want to give you this opportunity to be able to get down an altar in sincerity. Not because Pastor Meyer said it's time to pray. Not because somebody's looking at you. But genuinely because you want to be closer to God. We're not trying to impress Brother Eric over here. Say, well, Brother Eric's looking at me. He's going to see. He's going to think I'm backslid if I don't go to that altar. We need to check up from the neck up and find out why our what our motivation is and why it is we do what we do. Why are we faithful? Is it because we got what Elisha had? Are we just trying to impress somebody? I believe we got some folks here tonight that have 
what Elisha had. Some of us may could use a little bit more of what he had. Some of us may say, Pastor, I've made it out of Gilgal, but I can't quite get to Jordan. Some have made it to Bethel and say, I can't quite get to Jericho, Pastor. I've gone, I've gone so far, and I need more of God. I'm going to give you this opportunity. Will you come on up to the altar? I'm going to ask you to find yourself a place in this altar, just an old-fashioned opportunity for you to touch heaven and heaven to come down and touch you. I'll be honest with you, our church needs more prayer warriors. I wonder, is there anybody that is willing to get in the altar and say, God, I've got a desire. I want to be a help to other people. I want to be a blessing to